Hey Leute, willkommen auf Laser Google Land, dem Anarchie-Server mit der IP 149.202.127.134, alternativ auch mit der Domain sillyhoom.com. Und wir schauen weiter das Video von Aaron Jones, Programming Defensively. Wir sind bei einer Stunde und zwölf Minuten. Ähm, ja, also folgendes ist passiert. Ich habe auf Kamera ein bisschen wieder zum Spawn getravelt, um hier quick ein Bild vom Spawn aufzunehmen für eine weitere Werbeaktion. Ähm, ja, hat anscheinend nicht so geklappt, weil der Server ist immer noch leer. Aber we will get there, I guess. Ähm, genau, deswegen unbedingt auf den Server jetzt beitreten und dieses Video ausmachen, damit, ähm, damit hier mal ein paar Spieler wieder sind. Und damit würde ich sagen, let's go, starten wir das Video von Aaron Jones. Äh, Link zum YouTube-Video, was wir hier im Hintergrund schauen, ist wie immer in der Beschreibung. Auch ähm, die IP-Adresse des Servers ist natürlich in der Beschreibung. Und gibt es noch was zu sagen? Ne, nicht wirklich. Yep, Python pen test tools. So there's huge, you want to be able to work with networks, here it is. Debugging, there it is. Reverse engineering, we've got it. Fuzzing, you can do it. Web, forensics, malware analysis, got to deal with PDFs, uh, tons of miscellaneous stuff, all kinds of libraries and tools, even books, okay? So talks, slides, loads of stuff, it's all curated for you. So if you're interested in becoming a penetration tester, if you're interested in doing software, if you want to learn more about secure software development, You have everything that you need here, step by step, for you to be able to go through and start learning about the things that you're interested in. Pen test framework, right there. Okay. More information on that. And then, of course, the curated list of awesome lists. We've got a curated list of lists. <laughs> you can go through here and get super meta as much as you want. You've got gaming, editors, books, theory, big data, security, content management systems, decentralized systems. You want to start learning about uh, machine learning, anything like that. Just tons and tons of links. Now, does anybody notice what tool I'm using? I know you notice. What do I like? GitHub. What do I tell all my students? Git. What do you guys got to register? GitHub. That's right, GitHub. Ich bin auch großer Fan von, muss ich zuge <lacht> zugeben, obwohl es mittlerweile GitHub. Microsoft ist. Even if you're not a developer. Ah, das ist noch 2017. Wann hat Microsoft denn GitHub aufgekauft? Ich frage mich, ob Alan Jones immer noch so ein großer GitHub-Fan ist. GitHub. Ähm, obwohl Microsoft das jetzt aufgekauft hat. I put fanfiction. I literally sit down and write fanfiction and put it up on GitHub. I use it as a version control and storage for stories that ja, I write. Digga, ich mache auch alles auf GitHub. By the way, die äh, Welt von, also die Minecraft-Welt von diesem Server, auf dem wir hier gerade spielen, ist auch auf GitHub. Es ist ein Private Repository, weil ich nicht will, dass irgendwelche Leute die Welt runterladen und dann irgendwelche Bases äh, raiden. Ähm, aber es ist, ähm, ich verwende auch GitHub, um diese Welt hier äh, zu speichern. Und ähm, falls mein Server komplett abschmiert und alles abstürzt, liegt die äh, Welt hier noch auf den Servern von Microsoft. Ähm, genau, und vielleicht, wenn, äh, wenn ich den Server nicht mehr hoste, äh, ja, was unwahrscheinlich ist, dass es das innerhalb der nächsten Jahre passiert, dann werde ich dieses Repository sehr wahrscheinlich öffentlich machen und dann ähm, könnt ihr ja, die ganze Map hier auf GitHub einsehen und auch durch die Comets gehen und dann eben so ältere Versionen von dem Web euch anschauen und so und dann sieht man so hat man so eine gewisse Timeline wie sich das alles hier entwickelt hat ähm, ja ich habe damit selber noch nichts gemacht ich lasse es einfach nur laufen aber ich nehme an in ein paar Jahren oder so ist es sicher schön da mal ein bisschen äh, durch die alten Comets zu zu streunen oh mein Gott wieso sind hier so viele Mobs und ich will nicht sterben Oh mein Gott. Ähm. 
Ähm, ja, genau, so viel zu GitHub. Bin auch ein großer GitHub-Fan. Es ist lustig, dass Aaron Jones da auch so ein Fan ist von. You can use GitHub for anything that you want. GitHub is a fantastic tool. Every student that comes to my classes, what do I tell them? I tell them to get themselves a GitHub. I teach them how to push content to GitHub, pull content down from GitHub, how to clone things. I give them these concepts because they are some of the most important things that you can learn as a person who uses the computer. If you're using the computer, GitHub is an invaluable tool. I can't recommend it enough. Okay? And this isn't hyperbole. This isn't me just get crazy about GitHub because I want you to use it because I'm going to get five dollars for every person who signs up. This is real deal. If you want to start learning this stuff, this is the place you can go for this information, okay? Hey, look at that. Awesome pin trick testing. Here's Wobei man natürlich keinen GitHub-Account braucht, um, um sich den ganzen Zeug da reinzustellen. Wenn man nur konsumieren will und irgendwelche Sachen lesen und Tools verwenden, brauchst du ja nicht mal GitHub-Account. Aber wenn du halt deine Daten da speichern willst, synchronisieren über mehrere Geräte, ist nicht schlecht. Lots of stuff, right? And then here in a minute, we're also going to go over places that you can go to to actually start learning computer programming. And uh, if you live here in Arizona, most of your cities will actually provide you with free training on computer programming. And we'll get to that here in a second as well. So what about jobs? Lots of jobs are going to require software developers. But in addition to that, one of the issues that a lot of us are going to run into is the fact that many of us will not have security clearances. And that's where it gets tough, especially for those of us who say, I want to work in cybersecurity. I want to be a cybersecurity person, but I don't have a security clearance. It's tough. It's tough on anybody who doesn't have a security, security clearance. clearance. That's on the side. But let's think about this. Who had a security clearance? Edward Snowden? That guy had a security clearance, right? Did that do him a lot of good? About the gas, right? How about reality winner? NSA contractor? I'm sure everybody knows about her, right? Talked about her in here before. What was she? A self-proclaimed resistor and Bernie Sanders supporter. And it was on her uh, social media that said that I'm going to resist the government. I resist. I'm a resistor. I shut it all down. I'm going to fight back. So she had a security clearance while having in her background information that literally said, I'm going to punch the government straight in the eye. So how much do you think those security clearances do in terms of good? Not a whole lot. Okay? People are starting to pushes right now to revamp how uh, security clearances are managed. There are pushes right now from a lot of companies to look outside of. Now, in general, for you to have a security clearance, you have to have previously had military experience and then had a position that allowed you to keep your clearance. Because if you allow your clearance to lapse, eventually you lose it, you have to reapply for it. There's a lot of work that goes involved, that is involved in security clearances. And it is a huge headache for all members involved, whether it's the person who has it, the job that needs to be able to keep you up to date with that security clearance, the amount of money that's spent, which goes where? OPM. Who did what? Gave away all your information. So that was great, right? We have security clearances that people paid 70 plus thousand dollars for. For why? So it could go into a database that then they gave to some foreign actor. Okay, well that's cool. So that's that's the pinnacle of cybersecurity here. This is where we're at. Cesaro world, right? In addition to that, you're going to run into HR offices that don't understand what you're doing. Uh, when I sit my students down and we talk about penetration testing, I talk about continuous integration. I talk about automation. I talk about, okay, we're going to write an SQL query. Great. So what are we going to do with that SQL query? 
We're going to also write tests to send bad data to that query so that at the point where we get done checking in our query and we push it up to GitHub, GitHub spawns a Docker box and actually tests the database for us. It takes a copy of the database and sends bad data. It sends incorrect information to that SQL query. It sends all of this stuff and at the end it goes, yeah, everything here came back with what we expected. Expected behavior. It might break it. It might fail. Hat but GitHub it automated fuzzing? Oder muss man es halt selber fuzzing. bauen? Wahrscheinlich Just because something fails, in breaks, workflow. or returns with error. Gut, it's 2017. Damals gab es noch nicht halt in irgendeinem C right? CI workflow. It just means that we saw what we expected. We got what we wanted back. I can't play this here because it's super obnoxious, but this is um, approximately 35 minutes of Steve Ballmer screaming the word developers over and over again. It's fantastic. If you haven't seen it, it'll get you super pumped for coding. Okay, put it on repeat, sit there, just code away, code your heart out as Steve Ballmer just screams developers over and over and over again. Um, now let's get into a little bit of information about training. I've got tons of links here. Learn C. Hey, look at that, a web page where we can learn all about C. What's this? C programming for beginners. A whole bunch of information there. We have a, uh, no thanks. Please stop. Thank you. We have an ultimate list of resources to learn C and C++. We have C tutorials. And this can actually be pulled down as a PDF if you go further down in there. And then Linda, and I'm going to pause on Linda for a second, because if you have a uh, library card, you have access to Linda. That's training videos. That's everything. The complete Linda package is made available to you if you get yourself a library card. That's all you need. So for anybody who's sitting in this room or watching this right now who say, well, I can't just learn off a of text. Can't just hand me a PDF. And I can't yeah, good. Also, my fortune pickaxe is back. Ouch. Structured learning format for learning coding, for learning skills, Ouch. photography, Ouch. any of that stuff. You can use Linda free of charge as long as you go get yourself a library card. Ch Chandler is get Chandler is guaranteed. Not Tempe. So not Tempe. Chandler is guaranteed. So get yourself a Chandler one. Not sure. I know for Chandler for sure because. And that, that's where you got yours. So uh, I got mine through Chandler, and that gave me access to all of that stuff. So get yourself one. I'm a huge fan of Vim. Everybody knows I love Vim. I push Vim all the time. This is Vim Adventures. You can learn Vim while playing a game. Oh, yeah. So you sit Vim down, and you play a role playing it. game, and you just use Vim to complete the role playing game, and it teaches you the Vim skills. Ich show it to ich habe das mehrfach again, probiert, aber irgendwie so richtig guy, reingehauen hat es bei mir nicht. Ich bin auch ein Big Wim Guy, aber Alter, Wim Adventures. Connect to, you know, REST APIs with Vim and doing all kinds of crazy stuff with Vim. Love Vim. Vim is great. Guess what? Free classes. Here's another one. If you want to learn Ruby, if you're looking for a scripting language and you need Rails and you want to start getting yourself familiar with Ruby, there's Rails for Zombies. There's themes. There's fun things. You know, they've got cute little ponies and all this other stuff up here, but it gets kind of like, ooh, spooky. Spooky, spooky skeletons, right? Uh, spooky, spooky skeletons. I'm a big proponent of learning at least one traditional programming language, C, C++, Java, I don't care what it is, and of one scripting language. Uh, in my classes, I usually focus on C++ and Bash. Those are the two things that I show my students, and those are the two things that I get nice to familiarize choices. with. Nice choices. And a lot of that has to because of the fact that I want them to learn about like the difference between an integer and a character, or the difference between uh, Bash a bool and a law. Like, I want them get themselves familiar with a lot of concepts that maybe in their language of choice they're not going to entirely use, but they need to at least keep it in mind. Okay? Because what happens in PHP? We declare a variable, 
can we add a value to that variable, but do we ever have to worry about, like, it's an integer or it's a character? No, it doesn't matter. PHP is a scripting language, and what do we do? We just say, we just declare a variable, and throw information into it, and that's it. All you have to do. Look, the show goes on and on. Check I.O., another place to learn. Code combat. This one's fun. You can go to code combat. This one's great for kids. It teaches them how to write software so that a little man or a little monster goes into a room, has to traverse the room, and then at the end hits somebody with a sword. But it's giving you concepts and teaching you the basics. So if you want to go super hardcore and learn the old-fashioned way and get yourself that yarn star strap, you know, blue and white book, and just pound away at that, that's fine. Or if you want to sit down and learn how to do it using graphics and stuff, you can do that too. I see some Macs in here. Anybody who's running a Mac, uh, Apple has learning to code programs that are available inside of the Apple Store that are completely free. And in addition to that, uh, you can pack up your Apple stuff, and you can go down to the Apple Store, and they actually have learn to code classes uh, that they get for free as well. So nobody has an excuse, okay? Literally nobody in here has any kind of excuse in terms of, well, it's too expensive to learn anymore, or it's too hard. As long as you have a computer, the internet, and access to one of these web pages, or even the Apple Store, you can learn to code. But even with all this cool stuff, y'all remember Marcus? Marcus Hutchins? He was a security researcher who stopped WannaCry. Now I'm gonna make some inflammatory statements here, but before I do that, I just wanna say, I'm talking for myself, not for the PD. I'm a representative of myself, not of Chandler. And everything that I say is my opinion and not anybody else's, okay? So now that we've got that out of the way, I want to start talking about this guy. There was a huge uproar because he went to DEF CON 2017 and the FBI <coughs> showed up as he tried to leave and yanked this guy up. He yanked? So they're claiming that he created and distributed Kronos. And I have links in here that takes you to a little picture of Marcus. He's, where is he? He's in here somewhere. Hey, there he is. Hey, Marcus. So we have Marcus here. Okay, this is the guy that got picked up. He's the wanna cry hero. Oh right. my god. And he got stopped by the FBI. And so there's lots of information here for you all to decide how you feel about this. Kronos was known as an application that was designed, developed, and distributed to steal credit card information, banking information, and financial data. Okay? If you got this thing added to your system, you pull information from your computer, send it back to a command and control center, and then people could do financial crimes using this tool. That's what he got picked up and accused of. The actual charges include creation and distribution of tools used to steal bank account information, accessing and damaging computers he is not authorized to use, and wiretapping. These are really interesting charges, so they're probably not going to stick. Okay? He distributed software. It's really hard as a lawyer to say that that's a wiretapping if you didn't install it on your computer. Like, if I came to you and I added a bug to your phone, potentially I could be hit for wiretap. I did. I went in there, I added the bug, I sat there and I listened, that's actual wiretapping. But if I made a bug... Oh my god, ja klar, muss mein ganzes Haus abbrennen. Put it on somebody else's phone. Macht ja nur Sinn. Really hard oh, ey, bei mir geht alles like schief, firearms, Leute. One of the big things that they try to do is well, I want to sue the manufacturer of the gun because the gun was used to shoot somebody. But that in court has been defeated several times. They tried it, but it doesn't really work. So I don't think that these charges are going to stick. Now the next thing is, is I think that the reason why these charges were introduced, and this is all just me, but the reason why I think was to stop him from getting out of the country because he has more to do with the WannaCry, WannaCrypt stuff 
than they let on. Now, I'm going to give you an example. Who do you think has the highest rate of being an arsonist? What group of people? Firefighters. And what happens? A firefighter will go in and start a fire and then call it in and say, there's a fire. And then he'll jump in the back of his truck and run in with all of his buddies and they'll save the day. And what is he? He's a hero. He's a major hero. What? What do you see when you're an officer? Mm -hmm. You're sitting in your car and you're cruising and you look over. Das heißt, der hat selber WannaCry gebastelt und dann selber. And he's riding on his pink bicycle. And so you pull over and you go, Robbie, did you get that pink bicycle, man? And he goes, oh, man, I was in an alley and I saw it and it was under a whole bunch of stuff and there was trash all over it and it was completely covered. So what I did was I cleaned it all up and then I jumped on it and I was riding out to find a police officer right now so I could turn this bike over. I'm a hero. And you see it over and over and over again, okay? So, in my mind, when I look at this, you had essentially every single security operations center, every single major computer security group stood up when WannaCry went down. It was using Eternal Blue. It was doing all of this stuff. It hit the NHS, Na National Healthcare Services, over there in Britain, hard. They were literally having to stop surgeries because the tool stopped working. This was a panic situation to the max. You have all of these people standing around trying to figure out how to stop this thing. And then this no-name guy jumps in and registers the URL. Stops the whole thing dead in its tracks. Oh, ist das nicht dieser YouTuber, der das gewesen ist? That seems odd to me. And I'm not saying that it is unknown for just some rando person to be able to beat out essentially every single major cybersecurity group in the entire world who all had eyes on this thing. But doesn't that seem like a huge embarrassment to you? Doesn't that seem like a huge issue? with what we as security researchers are doing, if within moments of this thing getting out, this quote unquote no name kid had access to that code in his parents' house, he had already spun up the stuff to monitor the system, immediately identified a URL and had this thing on lock. And nobody else did? That's interesting. That's strange. That seems like an odd situation. And in addition to that, that's a huge black eye and a massive embarrassment for any of these individuals who are involved in cybersecurity to be beat out that way. Could you imagine if you were the, the person writing the check every month for the millions of dollars that you're paying out to one of these major cybersecurity firms to do active network intrusion detection and artificial intelligence control intel, uh, whatever the buzzword of the day is, but they're always constantly <laughs> making different stuff that they're selling, right? Mm. All these groups are doing it. Dell, uh, Sophos, whoever. What's that? IBM. They've all got like all these tools and we're forking out millions of dollars for these tools, but all it took was a kid in his basement in his mom's house to knock all of that out. Man, it's a big deal, right? And then you find out that he's involved in Kronos. And then you find out that he was involved in Alpha Bay and Hansa Market. We'll get into that here in a second. Then you start finding out that shortly after he got arrested, guess what happened to all the Bitcoins that were put into a wallet as part of the ransom that was paid out for some of these computers? Immediately emptied. He gets popped. A short while later, after all of this time of that money not being touched, this kid finally gets arrested and all that money gets yanked out. That's a very interesting choice of when you're going to pull your money. So Kronos was sold on Alpha Bay and Hansa Dark Web Market. What did we talk about in here? We talked about Hansa and we talked about Dark Web Market. That was our last class. We came here for that, and you'll remember that I discussed The individuals using Bitcoin were going on the internet and they could buy heroin and they could buy auto injectors and they could buy all kinds of narcotics and 
sex slaves and all these different things, and we kind of went on a safari through the internet, like all the deep, dark crevices to sort of see what people are doing. Well, guess what? The Dutch looked at Hansa Market, and they said, we've got that. We'll take care of that. And they picked up the phone, and they called the US, and they said, hey, we just captured the Hansa Market. We're going to keep it totally on the down low. Anybody who's located in the US that we can figure out is using this thing. We're just going to start shipping you their information so you guys can start arresting them. So make a list. And that's what they did. So the US and the Dutch, in conjunction, got together, started knocking over these web pages, keeping them up and running, letting people use them to buy and sell illicit goods, track these individuals, and immediately started going out and busting them just recently. And if you go to these web pages that I actually have linked from here, so who knows, maybe I'm on a list too. <laughs> <laughs> you never know, but they have seized the site. Okay, so the sites are seized; they're shut down. People on Reddit are freaking out. All the dark markets have said, "Hey, got to cool it. Don't be buying heroin for a little bit because we don't know what markets are okay and which ones are not." There's a whole bunch of stuff happening in these markets right now. Okay, and I've got a link to the law enforcement operations so if you want to read about it. It's super interesting. And it's in there, and if you guys have time on your own, feel free to sit there and just read about what really went on with this. Because this is what's happening all over. And I want to make it clear, we've already talked about this, it's not hard to really start unmasking these sites when you think about it, because nobody's really using these sites. What are they being used for? Illicit stuff. When I got on there to do that class, I couldn't find you a single cat meme couldn't find you a single funny picture. I couldn't find you quotes from the Bible. But what could I find you? I found you heroin. I found you drugs. I found you little kids being forced into sex slavery out in Europe. I could find you any of that stuff. And that's what's on those sites. So either we start cleaning up the streets and improving the neighborhood, or we're going to have a big problem when they finally get up in front of grandma and they say, Look at all this filth. What do you want to do with it? And she passed a law to shut all that down. Nobody can use Tor and VPNs and all that stuff. We're going to start making it illegal so we can start kicking in doors. Why? Because there are no cat memes, no recipes for cookies. There's nothing on there. It was all bad stuff. And in addition to that, the guy who essentially wrote the stuff for making those kind of servers was at DEF CON, and he essentially said the same thing. So I beat out his talk by literally a couple of days where I said, hey, there's nothing good on there. And he was like, yeah, there's not a whole lot of stuff on there. <laughs> and what is on there isn't very good. So we're going to look at some of these answers. Coders develop the tools we use every day. Right? If you're a software developer, what are you doing? You're making tools. People are going to use them. So make sure that you're paying attention to some of the problems that are out here in the world. OWASP is an organization that provides unbiased information about internet and computer applications. I use the term unbiased, not entirely unbiased, but unbiased. Okay? Leave it up to you to get your own biased opinion about whether or not you like OWASP. The testing phase. When we start working on code and testing, and I kind of mentioned it with the continuous integration and things like that, we can constantly test code. So use that testing phase to also look for security problems. Don't just look to see if the user's name come back, comes back correctly. Also use that time to make sure that only the user's name can come back, that that user's name is sanitized, that nothing else can come from there, and that there is some kind of warning to let you know if somebody did figure out a way to get this thing to spit out a social security number. We want to look for those problems, keep them in mind, and try to cover as much as we can. They call it code coverage. And you'll see it sometimes. You're on a GitHub account, and they'll say there is 87% code coverage for this. And that means that they're trying to, to cover as many functions, as, as many tools, with as many tests as they possibly can. Okay. A buffer overflow happens when software tries to continue writing past the start or end of the buffer. For many of us who, was in the, who are in this class, when I was talking about stack and buffer and things like that at the very beginning of the class, I bet that was sort of a foreign concept. But by now, we've all got an idea, right? Candy goes in the bowl. The bowl is my buffer. I can reach in there, the candy's my stack. I'm pulling out little pieces of candy and I'm using them. 
easy as that. Just a very basic breakdown. And dry stands for don't repeat yourself. Make functions. Follow the coding standards. Do what you need to be able to do to write testable code. I have a function. What does that function do? One thing. That function does not print and SQL and format and so on and so forth. That function does one thing, one thing well, and I test for as many problems as I possibly can off of that single function. Dry. Don't repeat yourself. Just make sure you pay attention to each one of these items. Obviously, software development skills are so important for security researchers, network engineers, and more. People are constantly coming out and saying, we need more coders, right? And people go, well, if we have more coders, that really dilutes the surface. It doesn't, believe me, because most people are not looking or thinking about this stuff. You have a lot of people who are jumping into coding because it's an idea of, I can do coding, I can grab Bootstrap, I can grab a copy of WordPress, and I'm throwing up plugins in no time, okay? And they're not thinking about how any of this stuff works security-wise. They're not thinking about what they're putting themselves at risk of, none of that. We need good coders. We need good cybersecurity experts who know the code inside and out. The jobs that are going to necessitate having some sort of software engineering or software development background are going to shrink. They're just going to continue to shrink. So learn yourself one traditional programming language and at least one scripting language. I'm telling you, if you can learn Perl, Bash, Ruby, Python, and grab yourself a copy of the GCC and do a little bit of C programming, even those basic concepts will serve you for a long time. Uh, also, closed off source code and uh, walled off systems, we need to remove those from the landscape. They gotta go. Uh, we need open source software. And we need all of you to be able to look at it. Here's a question for you all. Who here, raise your hand, if you have read every <coughs> single line of code going. in the Linux kernel? <sighs> Next Folge kann ich es predicten, wenn er sagt, nope. ich sag's euch, Leute, so right? oft wie er das wieder hat. Hey, wir haben immerhin eine Folge, Folge von diesem Kernel-Dude angeschaut, aus äh, Motivation hier von Aaron Jones. Über dieses F-Trace, S-Trace. Who's gonna sit down and review that code? Does anybody here feel confident enough to say that if they were actually to start tomorrow and sit down and start reviewing the kernel, that you would feel confident in knowing that your skill set puts you at a level where you could review that code and actually find problems. Yeah. It takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, and people are still finding problems in software all over the place. Eternal Blue, SMB version 1.0, but 1996. That problem existed since 1996, and not a single person got up and fixed that. What are my recommendations? Use Linux. Use Linux all day. Always use Linux. ABL, okay? Always use Linux. Learn yourself to programming languages. Do some skill crossing. Be familiar with this stuff. Register your GitHub and contribute to the project. Okay? I can't. I, I keep getting the same questions constantly. I get phone calls. Hey, man, what do I need to do to kickstart my, my, my career? What do I need to do? You have a GitHub? Oh. Didn't you take my class? Yeah. Why didn't you get a GitHub? Uh -huh. Well, I mean, I don't want to have to actually like put in work. I just want money. <laughs> get yourself a GitHub. Start contributing to projects. Look at open source software. Learn from other people. Get Look GitHub. Get rich. You know where I started? When I started with GitHub? I started by going and finding projects that I liked that were written by people with poor English skills and translating their documents to good English. That is where I began. Classic. And, I was, and that taught me how to do pull requests, how to interact with other people on GitHub, <laughs> how to work with issues, how to make issues, how to reference ich bin einfach Aaron how to work Jones, with Markdown, Leute. and how to work with documentation. Ich bin einfach that's dieser where I started. Typ. Helping people translate their stuff from Chinese or from uh, German or from any of these other languages and turning it into something that didn't look like they just ran the word to a grinder. And I got stars and hearts and people would say thanks. Okay, and that's been an issue. That's if you're not a coder. Start with documentation. 
That's where you begin. And then pay attention to what software you're using. Choose open source. So we're almost done. I got like five minutes. Does anybody have any questions, comments, anything else that I can answer? No? Yeah. For education, uh, actually on the way home while studying, and I just create a Ed X account, and they do some of the lectures, actually pretty good. Oh, okay. Which what? Ed X? Oh, okay. So the, the comment was made that this individual here created an Ed X account and was listening to some of the stuff on the way home, and that those are good lectures. So that's another opportunity, another place for you to listen. And um, I guess I should mention that. If you have the ability to run some of these lectures in the car while you're listening, I mean, that's the oldest trick in the book, right? Or you listen well, to them while the playing on Minecraft servers and, and advertising the, the Anarchy server, server, that's also an exactly. uh, option, so opportunity. You can take this stuff, and what can we do? YouTube DL, right? You go to YouTube, YouTube DL, one of the videos that we want to be able to listen to, use FFmpeg and strip all the audio out, turn it into an MP3, put it on a USB drive, and shove it into your car. Right? We're all computer programmers in here, software okay. developers, systems Sind engineers. Sind jetzt? We should all be able to use Bash and pull down a copy of a video ich, off of YouTube. Wer ist denn seine audience? audience? Wer sitzt denn da drinnen? Kann mir das mal jemand sagen? I've got two scripts in my GitHub that you would find that allow you to do just that under my uh, dot file. If you go to GitHub and hit my dot file, you'll actually see this is how you pull video and strip out the audio all at the same time off of GitHub a single command called music rip because I only use it for like pop open source stuff. Sure, absolutely. So the question was, should we have exposure or skills in SQL or SQL? Absolutely. Databases, very important. Get familiar with them. Understand what is going on in the background of that database. Uh, so, case in point, WordPress search is not good. If you've ever used raw WordPress search, it sucks. Super terrible. So, we had a problem with that at my job. So, I went and I started learning about Elasticsearch. And then I learned about a plugin that allows you to work with Elasticsearch very easily inside of WordPress. And so I added an Elasticsearch server, and then I added that plugin, and I worked with it internally, and I got all of those queries ready. And now we do optical, optical character recognition on all of our PDFs and all of our other stuff, and it all gets popped into Elasticsearch. And so as things get added on our network, we can search all that stuff. Nice. And it just comes from getting the exposure to learning about different tools and different stuff that's out there in the world, getting familiar with it, making it available to yourself, and then deciding, is this something that I can work with, is this something I can deploy, and can I work with it like maintenance-wise? Can I take care of this thing? And guess what? For the first week, it didn't work. Because I didn't have enough CPUs, and I didn't have enough RAM, and I was crashing the server, and I couldn't figure out what I was doing, and it took me a little while of reading documentation, familiarizing myself with the actual config files, the .yaml, and learning, and eventually adding more CPU, adding more RAM, I got all the configurations correct, and then after extensive testing, the thing works, and we can look inside of PDFs, we can look inside of all of our documents, and we can see, because of that OCR, all of the stuff that we're uploading, we can search by that stuff. So yes, that whole long story turns into start learning about all of the tools, anything that you can. Learn about your SQL, learn about your last search, learn about any of this stuff, because it is going to be a benefit to you, regardless. Anything else? I'm going to shut it down. Uh, are you going to there? No, and I'm not either. So there is a dinner that is available at BJ's. I'm not going to be able to go. Uh, but if you all want to go so you can do some networking, feel free to do so. If you don't, that's okay too. But I recommend that you all talk to each other for a few seconds just to make sure that not just one person shows up. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming out. I really appreciate the fact that you were here. Woo! And if there is anything else that I can do for you, do not hesitate to reach out to me. So, thank you. Ja, Leute. Oh. Das war mal wieder eine 
absolut grauenvolle Folge. Äh, wir sind eigentlich wieder am Anfang, so, so gesehen. Bei Folge 0, alles verloren, wieder am Spawn. Wir haben hier ein sich wiederholendes Pattern. Das doch wunderbar. Ähm, das war Aaron Jones auf dem Channel Brian Club. Und ähm, ja, mit dem Vortrag über Programming Defensively. Hm. Genau, den ersten Teil haben wir in der Folge davor gesehen. Wir spielen hier auf einem rohen Vanilla Server ohne Regeln, ohne Plugins. Ganz pure, so wie Microsoft es uns bereitgestellt hat. <lacht> Immer auf der neuesten Version und ähm, mit einer recht hohen Uptime und einer lang geplanten Uptime. Also wir reden hier von mehreren Jahren, die dieser Server betrieben wird. In den ersten paar Jahren werde ich noch aggressive Werbephase schieben, wie zum Beispiel diese Dauerwerbesendung hier, wo wir jetzt schon 70 Folgen Dauerwerbung haben für diesen Server. Ähm genau, und danach äh, soll der Server so vor sich hin tudeln. Das ist soweit der Plan. Hm. Genau. Und sonst, ähm, ich brauche ein Schwert. Oh mein Gott, ich brauche ein Schwert. Ich brauche ein Schwert. Ich brauche jede Menge Zeug. Ich habe ungefähr alles verloren, aber ich denke, das ist ein Abenteuer für eine nächste Folge. Würde ich jetzt so mal sagen. Und... Ja, dementsprechend ist es dann... <lacht> das mache ich hier. Äh, Ende der Folge. Und ähm, Link zu, zum Video ist in der Beschreibung. Ähm, die IP-Adresse des Servers ist auch in der Beschreibung. Und dann sehen wir uns in der nächsten Folge wieder. Ciao.